Oh, this is so exciting. So this is my seventh summit. Like, it's so amazing to me to be able to say my seventh summit. And for the most part, as all said, um, uh, me and um, all those fabulous experienced designers out there and lab staff, we sit here because we want to do what you guys do. We want to take the inspiration, we want to take the learnings, and we want to apply it to the other stage where we work. And that's how I actually think about it. We have two stages. This one that we share with you um, these two days out of the year. And then this other stage where we do our work the other 363 days of the year. And that's the stage that we call our real world experience labs. And I think what is so, it's, it's a place where we work, but I think more importantly, it's a place where we all share a purpose and a mission, um, which is to help accelerate transformation in our institutions, our societal institutions where it matters most our schools and our universities, our school districts, our hospitals and our healthcare systems, and our public service agencies. So we are also all connected um, by that common vision, and I think through that are also connected to that common vision with all of you. Uh, my role in this, as Saul said, is as chief market maker. And um, I've come to realize that um, chief market maker is more a statement of purpose than it is an actual title. It's a daily reminder um, of what I think is important, of what Biff thinks is important, that we need less leaders who are focused on incremental improvements and more leaders who have given themselves permission to forget like, what is and, and try and improve it, improve it and to focus more on what needs to be or what should be or even what could be um, and then figure out how we're going to make that real. Um, and it turns out um, that market making and I um, go way back, um, though as many of you probably had the experience, I didn't actually know that that's what I was doing until I met Saul. Um, so um, I, I'm generally driven by two guiding questions um, when I am moved to do something. Um, the first is, will this opportunity give me um, the space and the platform to make a meaningful difference in the world? So that's a common theme that we have heard um, on this stage and in every conversation we have had in the breaks. Um, that's one of the things that drives me. It's a very heart question. Um, the second question is more of a brainy question. Is this opportunity impossible to explain to, pos to everybody in the universe? Because that's how I know I'm sort of out there on sort of the edge of something that I think is really meaningful but doesn't yet exist and should exist. So that's how I think about, um, that's how I think about market making. I started my career and I grew up um, in, a sh in the world of social entrepreneurship. Um, I was part of the leadership team at Ashoka, which was the first organization to coin the term uh, social entrepreneur, um, to identify and invest in social entrepreneur. And as much as sort of like, you know, um, those institutions are now commonplace, for us, the work at Ashoka was actually about building the profession and the institutions for social enterprise. It's so that Deb's Blue Lobsters could actually aspire to be social entrepreneurs entrepreneurs, so that people like the folks we've had from Hatch can put up their name tag here and have social entrepreneur, social impact entrepreneur underneath what they do for a living as their title. Um, so we were really sort of, we were really early on in that because at that time um, we didn't have that sort of, it wasn't a household name, and I kid you not when I would sit down and, and this is verbatim I sat down with a um, an investor once a high net worth individual and I asked him um, to to you know I wanted him to hear the story about Ashoka, and at first he joked he's like well is that a Japanese food processing plant, and you know I kind of like roll my eyes which I do very subtly and very well and. Um, it, <laughs> He said, um, and I said, no, um, we're actually, you know, we're really trying to build this profession of social entrepreneurship. And um, to which he said, is that just like a really highly talkative, people loving version of an entrepreneur or something different? <laughs> so that's what social entrepreneurship was <laughs> at that time um, and why it was sort of such a market making opportunity. Um, after um, Ashoka, I was still focused on building this institution um, that would support um, social entrepreneurs. And so I jumped into this um, crazy cool idea that we didn't actually have a category for. I joined the startup team at Global Giving. And Global Giving is one of our, our first, actually Global Giving I think might be the first ever crowdfunding platform, only we didn't know to call it that at the time. And my two co-founders actually shared the um, stage previously in, pre in, in years, so they'll do it more justice than I can. But the notion of um, Global Giving um, was that it was a platform where networks of people who wanted to do good in the world could connect, could connect with networks of people who were, had the access to the funding to do that. 
And um, so that was really cool, but we didn't have a word for it. Um, so we called ourselves eBay for good. We would call ourselves, um, a, um, to the wonky folks in the room, a, play, a space for global development. Sometimes we called ourselves a secondary market. Um, so we launched in 2001, and it was really fabulous that um, the Jobs app came along a decade later and gave us a title that actually said this is crowdfunding. Um, and not only did it give us a category that we could play in, but it actually also made it legal, which is always you know, good to know um, when you've been kind of playing in a space for a decade. Um, so that's what uh, global giving is to me. And, and I spent a lot of time continuing to do um, this, this sort of similar work of supporting entrepreneurs because as we've talked about, entrepreneurs and people who have given themselves permission to create change is so powerfully important in the world. Building the institutions that support them is so incredibly important. Um, and, um, and then to kind of use Whitney's term, I sort of felt myself um, kind of being pushed off the edge of that S-curve um, because, and, and, and what was sort of driving that push was my impatience, which is never a good thing. I think it's always, my impatience is always what drives me off the S-curve and or any curve. Um, so the thing about entrepreneurship is that it was pretty much like, you know, bottom up, right? And it's really good and it's really important, um, but it wasn't creating change fast enough. And so I really wanted to figure out how can we actually create more gravity in our leading institutions so that they can do this faster. They can create change because they have capabilities at scale that we need. Um, and so, and what could that mean? So I started stud um, studying systems design and human-centered design and um, collaborative innovation and networked business models. And I started sort of like, I didn't know what I wanted to do and I started talking to a friend of mine who had actually just come from this very conference and she said, I have no idea what you're talking about. But the good news is, I just came from a conference where Saul Kaplan was on the stage and he was talking about the same things and I have no idea what he was talking about either. <laughs> so the two of you totally need to connect. And I was like, score, there's another wonky person out there. Um, and so then I did the one thing that I advised none of you ever to do. I drove down to Providence and I had like a four hour lunch with Saul. And I convinced myself that it would be a really great idea now to move my family here um, and to help catalyze the next um, generation of market makers and specifically the next generation of market makers in healthcare and education and public service. To this day, I'm still terrified whenever Saul schedules lunch with me. I know something's afoot. So <laughs> um, that is sort of um, my career in all of this. And so um, we've talked a lot about self-organizing purposeful networks. I really actually do think it is core to market making. And so I, um, I think it's a really big idea. So in um, sort of the bi in Biff's speak, um, I want to talk to you about self-organizing purposeful networks. I want, it's a big idea. And when we, when we talk about big ideas, we encourage leaders to be thinking big, but to start small and make it real, and then to scale really quickly. So um, I'm going to use that arc to tell this story. So we have this big idea of self-organizing purposeful networks, and I want to put it in the perspective of fairies. <laughs> this is my daughter, Clara, and um, she just turned eight years old. Um, we really encourage honesty and transparency and open conversations in our house. So at any point in time, if you ask her how she is, she'll tell you she's fine. Um, or um, sometimes she'll take a more philosophical view of the world, reflect on the past couple of years, and tell a total and complete stranger, well, it's been hard. My parents got divorced, which is how she says it. My dog died. And Harrison, who's the love of my life, is passing a rumor in the first grade that Santa Claus might be a myth. <laughs> and so it's like when you look at this child and you actually think about her as a user, the one thing she needs in the world is she needs to believe in something, if we take that same view. So um, uh, the conditions were right for this on our summer vacation in Maine. Um, we go to this highly island uh, that's off the coast of Portland. And, um, uh, and, and we go to this little camp that's nestled on this cove on the beach. And um, Clara immediately, like, she gets to the island, she runs to the beach, and she starts building this magnificent fairy house. And this fairy house has um, a walkway. She's sort of painted the walkway. It's got the porch. It's got two stories. Um, it actually has an external yoga studio, which is really important in the fairy um, community right now. Um, it has a built-in um, sound system and chimes um, so that we could hear every day. And so um, Clara would, every night, she would bring a gift down to the fairies of corn or something from dinner. Um, and in the morning, she would be rewarded with another gift. So sure enough, 
my sister who was on the island was colluding to make this happen, which is always a lovely experience. And so my sister is leaving the island, and I suspect that when she leaves the island, um, the fairy narrative will too. Um, only it doesn't, because on the ferry she goes out on, um, my partner, his two daughters, and their two friends join us. And so the collusion continues, because Clara immediately enlists the older girls in this narrative, and sure enough, every morning there continue to be gifts for her. Except then something happens, um, which is that there's commotion one night, and there is like messaging in the sand from the ferry, and it's written in ferry. And so it's, it's a big deal, and the, the big girls come, and they take me aside, and they're like, uh, so what do you want us to do with this? Because we just, we don't know this. And I said, I said that's great, because I don't speak or write fairy either, so I don't know how to help you. And so it turns out, sure enough, that the younger girls had also decided to join the fun, not tell us about it, and were also colluding in order to create this experience. So that's all good. Clara think, takes things into her own hands. She says, you know, she writes a note to the fairy. She says, my name is Fairy. The fairy writes back and says, uh, my name is Ash. And we're all like, what the f <laughs> right? <laughs> like, we don't know where that came from, but we also need to go home. Um, and so um, we pack up, we drive back to Providence from Maine. It's one of those long drives to get back to the house. And there's like, you know, people were switching bags and, and things, and there's lots of commotion in cars, and the dog needs to go out. And, but I'm struck by the fact that something's wrong on my front porch. And what's wrong is that there's a bucket of tomatoes on my front porch. And I'm like looking at the tomatoes, and I can't figure out everything else. I'm just struck, like, this is wrong. Like, why are there tomatoes? I didn't leave tomatoes on my front porch. They're fresh. What are the tomatoes doing there? And then I'm sort of like, I'm like, oh my god, is this like a Snow White mo moment? Did my neighbors leave like poison tomatoes on my front porch, and should I actually eat them? And I'm like, no, I live in a great neighborhood. My neighbors would never do that, but I'm definitely not going to eat the tomatoes. And Clara comes up behind me, and she goes, Mom. And I said, yes. And she says, Mom, the, the, the tomatoes are from Ash. And she built us a whole garden. And sure enough, she'd gone out into the backyard, she takes me into the backyard, and my, fair, my, my um, garden beds, which had been um, weeded over all summer because I've just been too busy, have been cleaned out, new soil's been put in, and the vegetables have been planted. And somebody's left us a sign, because my house is commonly, I don't know why, referred to as the love bungalow, and um, somebody <laughs> left us a sign, knowing it well, and called it the love garden. And so I do um, what Carl Stormer <laughs> invited us to do, I just accepted the offer. I said, okay, ash is real, fairies are real, they've all contrived around me in order to create this experience um, that actually really delighted us, that actually met the needs of the users in the family, and is really very magical. And I think that this is what, um, this is what there's something important about this. Ten people across five families in three states colluded to create this experience that made the impossible possible and the unreal real and suspended the disbelief of not just the child but actually of the adult um, who knows better. And I think that this, there are three reasons why this worked. The first was that we all focused around a single user and the, need, and the job that she needed done. We each contributed different gifts which we couldn't have individually contributed um, at any point in time. Um, and the end user herself created the meaning of the experience that she needed to create, which was that she needed me and her to believe in this fairy network. That's the small way of thinking about self-organizing purposeful networks. But what could it mean for Dominique, for somebody for whom the system doesn't organize that well on a regular basis? Right? So Dominique is one of our um, favorite families down in Dallas, Texas, where me and a lot of my colleagues have spent the last five years doing work with Children's Health System of Texas. Dominique, when we meet her, is in a very high-risk pregnancy. And the reason why it's high risk is because um, she has a number of conditions that make it perfect to be high risk. Um, that she is an African-American woman automatically puts her in an accelerated class. Um, that she is pregnant with twins, that she already has two children, and between her four pregnancies, none of them will be based less than 18 months apart. Her partner is a smoker. Um, she has a chronic condition. Everything here is colluding um, to lead to preterm births. Um, and preterm births are a real and serious thing. We saw Carl Stormer's um, uh, um, beautiful pictures of him and his daughters and how tiny they are. Um, uh, my niece was born two months premature, and I remember when she was finally came home from the hospital holding her in the palm of my hand. I know how hard it is for mothers and fathers to not be able to hold their children directly. So preterm births are, are powerfully difficult. They have huge long-term health outcomes. And so, but when we meet her, she doesn't want to be told she's at risk of becoming another statistic. She doesn't want to be told she needs to take it easy. And the reason why she can't is because as Len tells us, she has job to do, 
and she has a lot of jobs to do, right? She has actually a job to do. She has to go to work and make income. She needs to find herself a better job because the current job she has is not going to work once she gives birth to two twins. She, needs to, she wants her partner to stop smoking. She needs to find a place where the six of them can all live together. She has jobs to do, and she just wants to feel okay about life and not this stress. Right? So in medical speak, we would say we need to address the, non, the social determinants of health. But that's not what we decide to do. We decide to do a, a design a business model um, that's going to focus on delivering family well-being. And um, we decide to focus on um, what we can do well, which is very limited given what she needs done. And we decide to partner with the most unusual suspects um, from uh, religious institutions to school systems to gyms to um, a host of other uh, to legal services to house job search services and we integrate them together um, when we do it because it's a prototype we did it with duct tape and spit um, uh, but we integrated it by actually building the back-end systems that enabled us to um, share data share information about each other um, to make the payment systems work so that people were participating in this value chain because there's a reason for them to participate. And, um, I, and I do not know, I do not know to this day, um, whether it was because of this experience that we created for her that met the job that she needed done, um, or if it was because of the grace of God, or if it was because of some version um, or some <laughs> version of the fairy network um, or some combination thereof, um, but she ends up carrying her pregnancy to term and she gives birth to two very healthy um, children, a boy and a girl. And I, so I don't know why that happened, but I believe, um, I believe that it happened um, because we met the job that she needed us to do, that we organized around the right reason. Um, what I do know is that we actually built a business model and designed a business model, a sustainable business model that could go to market that would do two things. We have enough evidence that it supports well-being and improves well-being. We have enough evidence that it supports and improves health outcomes. So we have a sustainable business model that can actually integrate and address the social determinants of health. More importantly, I know um, that Dominique actually now believes that there is a system that will work for her. And this is what I think the market making opportunity is. There are millions of citizens and students and patients like Dominique out there um, who don't believe the system will work. They're the jaded adults like me who don't believe in the fairy network. And so what I think the market making opportunity for us is not to imagine necessarily how self-organizing purposeful networks can help drive new business models, though it's a really important question. The question for us is not, what's the next best business model? Should I be moving upstream or focusing on population health or doing deeper learning? The question is, can we simply design a business model um, and a system of business models that give users like Dominique a reason to believe that the system will work for them? So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the work that we do on our other stage. Um, thank you to all the partners in the room and our fabulous staff who make this work possible. Thanks.